We will move on to item number two, and that's Jackson County Assessor resignation. Is a discussion of replacement? Okay. Dan Jordan. So, I know you each received a copy of a letter of resignation from the assessor several months ago. Um, the resignation was effective December 31st, or will become effective December 31st. Uh, our county charter um, does require that the board shall replace according to uh, order by statute when there's a vacancy for the uh, elected county office to serve for a person to serve until the next election, general election takes place. Um, the laws for an assessor require certain things for an assessor to be appointed. One of them is that they have to be a, either a certified appraiser and or a certified appraiser training program. Um, the certification for an assessor actually the determination as to whether or not they're certified to fill the position is actually made by the Department of Revenue, not by you all. So if you were going to choose to appoint someone, we would have to submit their qualifications to the EOR to make sure that they uh, were qualified. Um, they also have to have two years of office uh, accounting and management experience or two years working in an assessor's office. Those are the two primary uh, requirements for someone who you may uh, choose to appoint. Um, the reason why I put this on here today is you know, we'll have a, an election in May. Um, I know that we have at least two people, and I'm told that at least three people that work within the office intend to um, run uh, for the office, and I'm not sure who else may run. Um, but we're going to buy statute. Um, does allow, in the absence of the assessor, for the chief deputy assessor to perform the duties of the assessor. They maintain the position of chief deputy assessor, so technically you wouldn't be appointing them as assessor. They're just allowed to do the duties of the assessor in the assessor's absence. Um, so essentially what I'm, what I'm recommending to you because of the timing, and so that the staff don't get exposed to a couple of different people, is that we allow the chief deputy assessor to perform the duties of the assessor until the May election. If in the May election, because it's a nonpartisan position, someone gets 50 plus 1% of the vote, then they win office, you know, um, and my recommendation to you would be to approach them, to appoint them if they're willing to be appointed prior to their uh, January, uh, you know, um, taking of office. Um, with, if, if you choose to do this with the chief deputy, uh, my intention would be to pay her an out-of-class differential. That would be the differential between her current pay and the entry-level step of the assessor. You know, it would just be an out-of-class pay. She wouldn't be working in a new classification. And I would do that December 28th, uh, if you're okay with that. I have authority over the payroll system to do that, but I wouldn't want to do it unless you agree to this course of action. If you want to actually appoint someone, then we would need to go through another process. Um, and so, um, although the resignation isn't effective until December 31st, we only start people's change of pay on the pay period, which is December 28th, is why I'm recommending you do that. The other reason I'm recommending you do that is technically, uh, the, the assessor has been here for the last month or month and a half, or very infrequently been here, so the chief deputy's been serving this role anyways, because the statute allows the chief deputy to do that, whether you agree with that or not. That's the, the course the law provides. So she's, the, the chief deputy's actually been performing the duties of the assessor. The assessor um, could have just stayed in office for the entire year, and Oregon law requires the assessor really only to work one day a year, which is the date that they're required to certify the tax rolls. Um, he's already done that for the current tax year, so technically he could have stayed in office and not shown up, but he chose to resign. And so that's kind of the situation we're in. I don't know if you want to have a discussion about it, if you want to take a different course of action than I'm recommending. Uh, I, I feel very confident in general. I think she's probably I've been doing this for quite a while anyway. It's not going to be much of a change in his duties or the, uh, her day to day activities. I wouldn't think she's more than capable from what I've seen and every interaction I've had with her. Yeah, I agree. I think. Um, she can fill in um, as the deputy, chief deputy assessor with that step out of there. I, uh, 
I think Joe's more than capable. I think she's very good at what she does in terms of uh, I agree with the administrator basically saying she's been running the office for quite some time. But I also have a fundamental heartache by taking a, uh, an elected position and making an appointed staff position for over a year, or for a year. And there's no accountability to the people at that point in time for that office. So I want to I want to make sure that we're comfortable before we move forward that we understand that there's there's no way, to my understanding, for people to be able to do anything or anything. There's, there's no more elected buffer in that office during that time period, and that, that makes me uncomfortable. Hopefully, that problem will be rectified in May if we have a 50% meeting that needs to be a 50% uh, winner, and then at that point we can appoint that particular person to take the position for those final seven months of. 2016, and we, we would have essentially an elected position in that, or elected person in that position. I heard the administrator basically say we have multiple people running. Four? Well, it's at least two and potentially three that may file that I know of. So there's three. two, to my knowledge, there's two that have filed right now. So if just those two files, I would likely one of them will win 50% of the vote. If we have the third file, or a fourth file, that scenario doesn't possibly, that, that scenario changes. And still, for five months, we're still having a, an office which is very dear to people's hearts, so the taxation, the assessment of the private property, without any type of elected representation. And I just wanted to make sure we're clear on that. So, and that's where I'm very nervous, by not having somebody that's accountable to the people. So what is the alternative to having a special election? We make an appointment, and that person then is goes by the obligation of an elected official. But then you, then what you do have, they may be quote unquote an elected person, but they're not elected by the people. So you don't but have they to still answer to the people in the same way that we do, and we still represent them. But that's the way our charter is written, and the people gave us that authority in this event. Well, I appreciate the concern. Um, I. I don't see that <coughs> as being a huge problem. I, I don't think Joe is somebody, again, I'm not going to speak for her, I'm not going to assume I know what she would do, but I don't see her being, like, her accountability um, is not going to be a problem. And I know she's an unelected person in that position, and that changes her legal accountability or um, positional. Can, can I make one pretty significant clarification? She's not filling the position of assessor. It will still be vacant. She's performing the duties of the assessor in the assessor's absence as the chief deputy. You're not appointing someone to be the assessor right. that's not been voted for by the people or that won't be accountable to the people. You're choosing to delay your appointment of someone to that position. Um, if we're following the scenario that you laid out. Well, you'd be delaying it either way. I mean, Even if we appointed somebody, that person serves as the assessor, if my understanding. And it's not the chief deputy, they serve as the assessor in no, that office. So I didn't yeah. say anything different than that. What I'm saying is you're choosing to delay appointing someone. Now let me do clarify. You could go for two months and let Joe perform the duties and you could decide to appoint someone still if there's a problem and you choose to want to do that. It's not, you're, I, I'm recommending you wait until the May election because it's highly likely someone will probably win the election in May. Um, and then we don't go through two different assessors for the staff, but three in a year, since the current one, one you would appoint, and then the one who may win. Joe happens to not be running for the office, although I will say she does meet the requirements to be able to run for the office. She is a certified appraiser, too, and has been the office manager for at least two years. Um, <clears throat> so she does meet the qualifications if you wanted to choose to appoint her. I, would, I just don't recommend you appoint her for five months and then turn around and appoint someone else. Um, but, you, you know, that's, that's just my, my recommendation. You, if you want to appoint someone, you can, you're, it's certainly within your right and your authority to do so. A uh, statute actually requires you to do it. It doesn't require you to do it with any certain amount of time. I certainly see the wisdom in not having several different changes in that position in a short period of time and somebody who's more than capable and has been doing the 
job and allow that person to continue doing the job until the more permanent uh, assessor is identified. I see the wisdom in that completely. And, and just my opinion, um, I think it makes for smooth operations to continue on as a temporary fix. Uh, I know as a liaison to that department, I've gotten questions from citizens, and I've actually directed them to the to Joe Wright, and she has been accountable to them. She's answered their questions. It wasn't like she wasn't, and I think she would do a, a great fill-in job and, and at a time when the people do have an elected assessor um, at their, their vote. And frankly, my opinion is I would rather appoint her, swear her in as the assessor, for a time period in which a new election is held and not have staff run the office. She's not interested in necessarily being appointed. And the reason and why we turn her she, back to she, would, she, chooses. she would be required to resign her position uh, with the county to become an elected official. It's a different status. You're an employee versus an elected official. And there's no guarantee, and we can't even make a guarantee. It's, it would be violating employment opportunity requirements that we would return her to a job at the end of her appointment. I think we're, that, that would be taking unnecessary steps that if that need arose at a future date, we could certainly take. But right at this point, I don't know if those are the necessary steps. Um, again, right now, I think it certainly could be done at a, a time if that was deemed necessary. Like I said, to me, it's a, somebody that runs a taxation should be accountable to the people. And I, I think that appointment should be made. Um, that's just one position. And I see that's that's a, a an avenue to choose to take. I don't think it puts a different outcome than what what we're considering in just having her fill in. And you know, she's just as accountable. I feel either way. Well, considering the fact that there really hasn't been a person in there for several months, and we haven't had any issues. If, if, my, my guess is there's not going to be. If there is an issue that arises that necessitates us making that move, we have the ability to, to quickly and efficiently make that move and address the situation. Until then, I just think it's unnecessary, you know, back and forth. You guys do what you feel is good here. My philosophical, basic moral belief is that's a public office and it should be held by somebody that's accountable to people. And just to clarify, she's not going to hold the office. Okay, she's right. remaining to be the chief deputy. She's right. just going to per, per, she's going to perform any duties that the assessor may be required to perform in the assessor's absence. And I'll be just to be realistic, so you understand the process of taxation. There really aren't any duties that the assessor is going to be required to perform that have to do with taxation and assessment. They're going to be having to do with the management of the day-to-day -day operations in the office, because until we get to certify the tax rolls again then that's when the assessor it, it has to begin to make decisions or do activities that um, uh, have to do with taxation and assessment versus you know, approving pay, payroll for people and assigning work to people and those types of things. So I don't necessarily see there being a conflict with the public's interest even because there's no decisions to be made. The tax rolls were just certified a couple months back and uh, it's highly likely that you'll have an elected official uh, in the May election. If not, it'll be the November election, and you could choose in May to appoint someone if that's what you wanted to do, if there wasn't a clear uh, candidate to win who would be there to perform those duties that are specific to taxation and assessment with regard to people's property. And the concern I would have, too, is you know, if you have a true, open, free election, um, if we were to appoint somebody, I think that'd give that person kind of an unfair advantage going into that election, and it's not really going to be a, elected by the people. Um, That's what the assumption that somebody would appoint somebody that was running. I would actually submit that they would appoint somebody that was not running for the office, that had the qualifications to go and do the job, because it does well, it does have management and oversight for that department for that time period. And we're talking five months and potentially a year. 
And I, and I honestly believe that at, at minimum we should do our due diligence as commissioners to be able to look into finding somebody to fill that in that, in that potential. Because until we know if there's a third person running or any of that other stuff, it may not be 50%. So it's, it's hard, I mean, making something without on an assumption or a potential, I'm nervous with, especially when it comes to an elected office. Appreciate that concern. I feel I feel pretty comfortable with it as is in, in the fact that we're able to be agile and respond to any circumstance that may arise that necessitates us making a move like that. I, I feel very comfortable proceeding on that basis. Uh, and I, that's why I think how we've been operating is going to continue. It provides you know still accountability to the people and to the department. But how we proceed, and if it is a problem, I think we should address it. You know, at that point. And, and budget wise, I mean, if, if we were to appoint somebody, then we would have that additional salary going forward for the next five months. If I'm not mistaken. There'll be but salary savings by doing it the way that I'm recommending, correct? There'll be underspending. Of there actually would be overspending of the budget because of the payouts to the assessor when he left, which weren't budgeted, because there was not an anticipation he would leave. Right. And it may require the county to provide more support to the department to pay right. the cost of um, appointing someone. For what I see as a speculative possibility <coughs> that we may need uh, a person that's the actual interim or, or point of assessor, which I haven't heard anything compelling that would be basic moral belief that administrative personnel, staff, should not fill an elected position. Okay, just so I'm clear, they're not filling the elected position. I'm right. not recommending that. Exactly. Okay. The position is still vacant, which is essentially making decisions that that position would be vacant. That's <coughs> what the law provides for. And I'm comfortable with that. As a I like to say, oh, um, as I I'll kind of keep in touch there. And, uh, and you guys, if <coughs> there's a problem, I think we should address it. But I, I foresee it as a, it's a good time of year, this first part of the year, that um, this is just a temporary fix. This is something we need a motion and actually uh, just a... No, I would just... If you didn't appoint someone, she would be doing this anyways. Okay. So, uh, that's what the law provides for. What we're doing is what the law says is done. Until such point time that you would choose to appoint someone if that's what you choose to do. You're not, as I said, there's nothing in statute that sets a time limit for you to do that. So because of that, the state has contemplated, the legislature passed a law that says if there's not an assessor there, the chief deputy can perform those duties. Um, they're not, it says in law, they maintain their position as chief deputy for purposes of civil and uh, PERS purposes, they don't become an elected official status, um, they don't fill the position of the elected official, and so there would be no change in course of action except for the fact that I'm telling you I would expect to pay her out of class pay for the additional work that she may be responsible for. And um, until such time you decided you want to appoint someone, and just so you know, we you, you could choose to make an action to appoint someone with 24 hours notice if we need to notice a public meeting, so it's not something that would take weeks and months unless you chose to go out and recruit and, you know, review and interview and all those types of things. Can you foresee a specific situation that would require some sort of action by the elected or appointed person in that position inside of 24 hours that we couldn't respond to? You know, if you had somebody in mind, you would put it in there in 24 hours. Well, that would be the key piece. And we've known about this for a few months. Um, this is the first time we've discussed it as a board, outside of executive session. And um, frankly, I kind of see this as a last minute, just put staff in place to hold it. And uh, I'm uncomfortable with something. Well, I, I believe the board position, though, as far as I'm concerned, moving forward as we go, as uh, we are currently, Proceeding. Am I correct? Yeah, I haven't 
I haven't seen a problem. I mean, there's always potential for that. I've not seen one. And when there is, or if that happens, I think we should be ready to address it. Okay. Well, let's move on to item number three. <coughs> Board of Commissioners Fiscal Year 2016-2017 budget discussion. Amanda? So I sent you each an email yesterday. Um, and I also asked that a copy of what the PDF files I sent you in an email were to be enclosed in your packets today. Um, essentially, the Board of Commissioners budget is due in a week. And me and my staff prepare your budget based on your input and um, what we anticipate to occur. Um, one of the biggest things in your budget each year is determining the travel budget. So what we put together, and I gave you for reference the 15-16 fiscal year so that you could refer back to what we did last year. And I put together a draft that shows each training that we anticipate um, may be something you would attend with a cost per event. The cost per event, so if you go to this document that says page one of two, an AOC annual conference for one person to attend is $1,276. So we would need to know, basically I need to know how many people you plan to have attend each one of these meetings. Um, I did need some clarification from Commissioner Bridenfall. He had directed Morris to not register him for the NACO conference and told her, in fact, for any future NACO conference not to register him after what he's, uh, her quote was after what he's been put through by this place. I, I need to know if not registering him means that he doesn't expect the county to pay for it because that will change our budget significantly for uh, travel. Can you clarify what you mean? Well, first of all, the county doesn't, has never paid for that. They pay it up front and they're reimbursed on all of that NACO work. The only first thing of all, we're not, not, we're not fully reimbursed. That the only thing that's not reimbursed is my, uh, my salary. The rest of it is. There's a few pieces that doesn't receive 100% reimbursement be like the built flying. So there are a couple pieces there, but the board meetings that they attend on the national side are reimbursed back to the county. Okay, so just so I could clarify that, the portions of trips that Commissioner Breidenthal takes that are specifically related to NACO work are typically, and I have uh, verification if you all would like to look at them, he adds days to his trip for other purposes that may have to do with county business, but have not necessarily something to do with what AOC will reimburse us for with regard to NACO work. So typically when he takes a trip, we don't get reimbursed fully for, for the trip. We do get partially reimbursed for the trip with specific regard to the work that's associated with NACO. In almost every case of submitting reimbursements requests, the county's been accountable for a portion of the cost. And that portion I'm referring to is when I meet congressional members in DC, to be able to mostly talk about our timber and to be able to move uh, this legislation like 1526 that are very supportive of us getting back into working in the woods. So that's the pieces that are there. Okay. So, and the, the, the merits and the benefits of it, I think we're, we're yeah. going to discuss, but I think right now we want to look at the true costs of attending these. And I just received you. these documents yesterday. Mm -hmm. So I have yet to really have a time to get deep into them. Well, and what and I don't know if you've had time to decide what you want to attend or what you want to do either. But my question is, are, just to refresh me, what was our budget last year on this particular issue? I included the 15, 16 travel budgets last year. I don't have that. I just have the 16, 17. I just have the 16, 17. I didn't get last year. Okay, well I asked to have it included. Um, so we break it down by multiple things. So we break it down by memberships as part of your travel training event costs. Right. So, so those, don't record, those don't accurately reflect our memberships. So I'm just really, well, I hold on, I'm gonna tell you what we budgeted for 15, 16. We budgeted $45,390 for memberships. That was $41,000 for the Association of Oregon Counties. That was uh, $4,300 for NACO and $90 for notary commission requirements. Okay, Did, uh, and that was in 15, 16? That's the current fiscal year. Now, um, the associate, how much do we pay the OMC counties under the 15, 16 budget? Nothing. Uh, they're saying we paid over $70,000. They retained payment 
from the fund balance that they had that we previously paid. We didn't pay them something. They took that from fund balance. That was our contribution to the budget. To this last fiscal year? To the current fiscal year. Because it was my understanding that they submitted, when John Rasher was on the board, just leaving the board and I was going on, they submitted for a two-year budget of about $72,000, $75,000 per year <coughs> for this year and next year. And that was paid, according to them, so, and not necessarily from, so I understand as being on that board, that was paid by the county, not necessarily being so retained Let me, let me clarify the difference between a budget and the accounting of a budget. We budget in December of the year prior to the fiscal year beginning July 1st. When we budgeted for 15-16, what we budgeted for ONC was zero, because that's what Rocky told us to budget, okay? So if we end up, ONC counties decides to allocate a budget after the fact that we've budgeted zero dollars, then there'll be an additional cost. I'm talking about what we budget, not what we actually incur in accounting for our budget. Understood, and that's why I just want to make sure that we're, because we look at this, we want to actually reflect it accordingly as we go into the 16-17, uh, because I know that the uh, ONC County is going to be looking at a mitigation <coughs> assessment of excess of $25,000 to potentially the Jackson County as they look, look into moving into litigation. And our county may or may not agree to that. Right, correct. That's something that we still need to But it's part of the discuss. process as we discuss on the budget. If, you know, if we, if we go forward and do that and we remain with the ONC counties, we're talking that this next year is going to cost us $120,000 if we stay with the, the dues of $70,000 and the uh, litigation assessment that they're going to be putting out. Okay, so, and that's why I want to say, if we're going to be talking about this next year's budget, those are things that we should be well, talking about. I think that's a separate line item, but yes, we're going to have to have some conversations about yeah, that. Absolutely. That's our memberships. So we have budgeted at zero. I see that. I and see I know it's supposed to be about 70 something. So there is a, there is a contingency there, but, but everything else I think is still fairly accurate and, and worthy of discussion on what, what the costs are, what we see as the benefits um, that going forward we will derive from these uh, trips and what we choose to, uh, to allocate as a budget for them. What I'd like to do with this board is um, it's great. It's nice to be able to see this information. Thank you for putting it forward. I'd like to take and see last year's numbers. I don't have that with me and I haven't been presented that for the discussion today. I actually emailed it to you. When did I get it? Yesterday. <coughs> yesterday, okay. I, I missed it. I missed it too. So Sorry. there's been two of us that missed it. So um, what I'd like to do is go over that numbers from last year and dive into this a little bit deeper and then we can schedule this and meet again on it and have further discussion. Okay, can I ask you that what pertinence does last year's budget have on what we know or what we what we know these trips are for and what the costs are going forward? It's the cost going forward is what I can understand versus last year. I think, I think these are good applications. Yeah, can I just clarify something? There are some very specific questions that I, I, I noticed this agenda to receive input on. Um, let, let me first of all clarify that we do have what's called a central services fund fiduciary for things that are unexpected. They get reallocated out to departments if you have a cost that you incur that we don't budget for. We would not budget for something that the ONC may be considering to do. Okay. Also, with regard to the litigation that Commissioner Brian Paul mentioned, we would also not budget that in your budget because it's paid for from risk through allocation if we cost for litigation. I, I didn't come to ask about those things. I came to ask about the travel, which I said in the email that I sent you. I've specified each conference and committee and uh, training that we're aware of, that, my, that our staff are aware of, that they've booked for you throughout the several years and prior commissions and I just need to know, and we can go through them one at a time, whether you plan to attend or not. I think that's a reasonable discussion to have. And I don't think it's un unreasonable that we expect other departments to budget their travel as we should. Um, and three things, I'm just looking over the, what you sent us. The First of all, the AOC District Four meeting, the one in September, because I went to the meeting at the AOC, that is going to be in Medford uh, in September. So. That will take some of that off. Yeah, there's actually two meetings per night. I mean, two meetings per year for district meetings. So this was a cost per meeting, typically. 
and and I don't disagree that if it's an effort, it's going to cost less. Yeah. Um, and so this was this was based on you know if we were to travel. when we travel when you travel each one of these things is what it costs. And if we you know if you look at an AOC District Four meeting, if we over budget six hundred dollars because of the trips, I mean it's not going to have a huge effect on your budget. I would rather budget to make sure that we are able to cover what you want to do, no matter what it is. Um, the other thing is, in terms of accounting for cost of travel, whether we get reimbursed or not is really irrelevant as to whether or not we have an expenditure. It may be for, in, in terms of um, financial recovery, but in terms of a budget, you have to budget all your expenses. Now, we may turn around and budget being reimbursed as a, as a revenue, so, and, and that's what we'll do, but what I'm talking about here is expenses. Mm -hmm. And uh, my other comment is that I, is my, my opinion, if we travel on the county, <coughs> that, that we can make our reservations ourselves, that they go through the county, um, and if they're reimbursed, it's all handled through the county. And I'd like to keep that the same as well. I would agree. Is there, is there, I mean, again, we didn't really get into that. Is there a reason that you didn't want to uh, continue with that process that we should know about? As far as making your travel arrangements through the county, you expressed to Morris, I believe, that you didn't want to. At this point in time, I'm going to hold back on that. Okay, excellent. Um, so, so can I ask at this point in time, do we need to budget funds for you to be I able to? I would budget funds appropriately right now. So, um, there's several things that are, on, that are not on here that we traditionally attend or have over the last several years, like FRC. Actually, there's a third one. Yeah, I, don't, I just don't see it on this particular front page. Yeah, I, I asked the question in the email about the AFRC, and it's fine. That's why I asked the question. Are there other things that we need and, to budget for? And I think there are, and that's why I'm saying, you know, I just got this yesterday. I, but but I maybe like just go through time. the things we know about right yeah. now. They're, they're, they're listed right here. One at, I, all we have to do is go through them one at a time, and you let me know how many of you are going. Your, your budget's due in a week, yeah. so I don't know. I don't and the budget cycle is short for everyone, especially when you're in an indirect department. You're in it, all of your costs get, well, most of your costs, some of them get directly attributed to the general fund, but they get charged out to all the other departments. So for all the other departments to do their budgets, that's why there's such a short timeline for departments who get charged out, because they have to know what your charges are gonna be to be able to do their budgets. So unfortunately, because that's how your budget is funded, you're always first up and you have the least amount of time. And it's the same for my budget, and IT's budget, and HR's budget, and Google Council's budget, and Motor Pool's budget. We're all due. Sure. No, we need to do this. Um, so starting with the first one, the annual conference, ASA annual conference in Eugene. Um, I think that that's something that is, uh, that I will attend. Um, you know, so we need to continue our relationship. Yeah, I agree. We're going to see The AOC committee meetings. Um, that's one of those I think we do via teleconference most meetings and that seems to be adequate. That is adequate for me. I do the teleconferencing panels. It's, um, I sit on legislative, I sit on executive prepared, the um, board of directors and the other committees. The, Teleconference sometimes isn't practical. It's, it, it consumes most of the day to do all of that work. So should we budget you for attending? Yes. But I would recommend that there's times that you guys might want to attend also. So I would leave some room um, because as we go into the short session, we'll be working with, um, with the legislature very closely on some of these issues, especially on some of the marijuana issues and stuff like that. And having a commissioner inside those offices is important to be able to move the legislation forward because you, your voice as a representative goes a lot further than just a lobbyist voice. But I'm barring anything specific in this sitting, somebody to be there personally. I have no problem with the teleconference uh, method. If, if there is a need for myself or the other distributor personally, then yeah, we can adapt it. Right. Yeah. And I want to make, room, make sure there's room for that adaption is what I'm trying to say. Sure. Because I know as we go into February, 
um, for the list budget for one of their discussion points in the AOC board meeting here we had the other day was that we're looking at potentially doubling up in some of those February meetings uh, and the meeting prior to that, so maybe two of those months because it's going to be so crazy in the legislature. And that's when all the, as they're looking for everything from minimum wage increases and, and those issues that have impacts on our communities, uh, we're talking about having a really strong concerted effort on the commissioner's side to be able to have a strong voice in Salem this next cycle because we believe it's necessary. And, and, and the minimum wage is going to be on the, on the ballot. Or the, or the ballot. It's going to be very, it's going to be very heated. So I, I would, there's times that we're going to need you in, in Salem. So we can budget for the contingency of having to be there in person. I would say no more than a couple times a year. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, maybe four. On the outside, just on the budget. Okay. It doesn't mean you have to execute it, but having it there. So let, let me say, on the back of page two, we budget miscellaneous, miscellaneous meeting and events. So it covers five hundred dollars in accommodation, seven hundred fifty in meals, um, transportation. If there's a, an occasional meeting that one of you need to attend, that's where we usually pay it from. The, the cost for the CLC meeting is one person attending all twelve meetings, typically one meeting per month one night, two, two days, that are usually held in Salem. <coughs> the most recent one is held in Portland, I understand. But uh, this is an estimate. So, you know, if you can budget one attendee, you have miscellaneous if you if you choose to right. randomly I'm attend some yeah. event. I'm trying to say that I know that there's going to be about 14 meetings that you'll see, not just one a month. And ONC is going to be very similar to that because the last board meeting they talked about doubling up for a couple months and they, uh, they work through discussion through their litigation pieces. Well, at 12, that's one commissioner at nearly every meeting. I don't see any reason to, to up that number. I, don't, I can't foresee needing somebody there or more than one commissioner there um, at every meeting or more than 12 total. Well, any, any meeting I teleconference in was just an hour right. and two at the most. I mean, they're pretty short, and and um, although it's different not being there, I had they ensured I got had input, and right. I wasn't just you know a fly on the wall. But um, I I think the teleconference would be definitely <coughs> important um, to be in on on that, and then we have the contingency if we if there's something we need to be there for. So I guess. I feel pretty comfortable with the number we have budgeted. The, the one, per, one, one person, 12, 12 meetings. Yeah. Okay. I think that can be more than adequate. We do have contingency in this. So. Okay, so County College, obviously, we're not going to be, nobody that's going to be attending that. Uh, there is a commissioner up for election this year, so you could have a new commissioner. Uh, it'll be, in, it'll be in, the, in the fiscal year. Which so is 17. 16, 17 fiscal year, yeah, so that's what we're budgeting for. So oh. January. Um, okay, so let's budget for one on that contingency. Okay, so the district four meetings, um, two, one is going to be in Medford, as you said. Uh, and that's, again, not a huge budget. I know that that number's pretty. Well, at the AOC conference, I was the only one there at district four from our county. So, I, and I'm vice chair. I will be there. Of the district four. The? District four. Okay. Chris Boyce is um, the chair for our district. So will all three of you attend? Plan to attend both meetings? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the AOC Spring Conference. Um, I didn't go to that last time. I didn't either. Um, I. Didn't see much coming out of that that I felt I missed that I need to attend. You could give any shed any light on why that may not be the case. That we listen. Why? Right. It's a uh, basically it's just like the annual meeting. There's a lot of business that takes care of that's taking place there. Uh, they do have the regular business meeting uh, and the educational seminars that are all there also. They're very. Very good. I mean, <coughs> the, the annual conference is good. The spring conference is very, the, the spring meeting is very similar. Actually, a lot of business takes place there. 
this one's going to be interesting because of coming out of the short session. So you're going to get a lot of updates on what's happening coming out of the same I can, Yeah, yeah I can can well, the, the one that you're years. budgeting for is not going to be coming out of the short session. You're budgeting for 2017. The one that's going to be coming out of the short session is in the current year's budget. So that, that, doesn't, doesn't, that doesn't apply. Uh, that's right. I still feel the, the annual conference gives me, you know, as far as participating in this educational um, seminars, plenty of opportunity there, and I get the information via email on all their legislative updates. <coughs> and I, I don't think I'm going to the spring conference. I usually can handle their annual one. So we have, so I'm at the budget, anything for that or not? I'll do anything. They said then on the board they have meetings then. Okay, so the ONC annual meeting in Eugene. Obviously, the formula. I would be there. This is the annual meeting? Mm -hmm. That's the one that encouraged everybody to go to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll be attending the ONC annual meeting also. And they did encourage everybody to attend um, as we go forward to the meetings in January. Um, they said all commissioners that show up will have a place at the table. Okay. Oh, yeah. So, we'll on that on that the kind of so there's the annual meeting, which is what we're talking about here, then there's the board meetings, which I think Commissioner mm -hmm. Roberts is talking about now, which will be next. So for the annual meeting, should we put all three of you attending? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So the board meetings, we have budget of 11 of them, and the cost per person is 3,597, an estimated cost. Oh, no, I won't be going to all the board meetings, no. I'll do the annual the annual meeting, and then obviously Mr. Roberts will be at the board meetings. Mm -hmm. There's more than 11 board meetings, just so you know. Um, they, at the last meeting, they said they're going to double up a little bit coming in the first year, so be prepared for two meetings a month. For, uh, um, that was at the last board meeting. So there's more than one, and I'd say that's another point that I would like to point out. I would like to touch base with Rocky and ask him how they just think. Yeah. Them know. There's some of the times they don't think I get a number from Rocky before I would put that in there. That's what I'm saying, that there's a lot of information that we need before we do. What's a basis to start from? Know well, what we need yeah. to fill in. And that's the same as How many there will be is not relevant to whether you all will be attending. I will figure that out. Sure. I just need to know how many of you are going to attend, regardless of how many meetings there'll be. So do, do okay. I heard you, Commissioner Dyer, say you're not planning on attending the board meeting. Board Commissioner yeah. Roberts is, and Commissioner Brian Fall, I don't think so. I've attended for the last three years, or all the board meetings for the last three years. So I, right now I don't know. Um, there are some questions I had, that's why I wasn't really ready to go detail like this line out of line item. But you could probably budget for maybe half of them. The litigation piece is, uh, is important to move forward. Understanding that, uh, and I know Commissioner Roberts, you're, you're not up to speed on what they're doing on the litigation piece 100%. So. They're going to go over in January. Mm -hmm. So if we get six. I'll budget 1.5. Okay. okay. And the annual conference. Um, as far as it attending anything uh, with MAKO, that is the one I think is the, the most beneficial. That's the one I attended last year. I thought it was good to be in on those steering committee meetings and some of the educational piece. Um, I'm not planning on attending any other MAKO meeting, but that one I think I, I would like to attend. It's in Long Beach this year, so you don't have to go cross country. Yeah. Yeah. I would encourage the legislative conference. Uh, can, can we go back to the annual conference so I get a number for how many people will have? I'll be there. I probably won't. Okay. Legislative conference, um, I, I don't see a need, personally. To me, that one's important. That's when you meet with your congressional members on the hill and you meet with a lot of other congressional members on the hill. And that's your opportunity to tell Jackson County's story on timber and on the financial impacts of timber to Jackson County. 
And the biggest piece there is being able to meet with a lot of the East Coast senators and representatives and help them understand the impacts of the timber communities and getting back to work in our woods so that we have meaningful legislation moving forward. Your voice carries a lot more strength than any lobbyist back there. And I've noticed that over the several years that I've been doing that, it's, it's helped. We have a strong story in Jackson County with the 25 plus million dollars that we've lost out of the known on the Well, and when you say it's helped, I've seen nothing but reducing those numbers being continue to be reduced. Um, and, you know, I, I know we have our senators and representatives back there. They're supposed to be, obviously, and that's in that they're all doing uh, the greatest in that area. But um, my, my overall point of view is there's a lot of things that we could probably have some impact on, and there's a lot of costs involved, and our impact, in my opinion, is limited, and the cost starts to get higher and higher, and we have to draw the line at some point. And I'm trying to be judicious about the ones I think are necessary and the ones that maybe aren't as beneficial, and that's where I think the line for me is drawn. I don't see, again, that one taking the cut. I, I understand what you're saying. Well, I can, my only response back to that would be is I, I know that is important, very important, and to attend. Um, we have our senators in the state of Oregon that don't necessarily agree with Jackson County as it pertains to land management. And we, we can rely on them to be our voice, or we can have our own voice. Unfortunately, we don't have the vote in the Senate even if we go back for the NATO legislative conference. So but we have opportunity to talk to those people when we go back, to those people that are going to listen. Well, I, I'm not going to discount the possibility that we're going to change a senator from Rhode Island's mind on timber issues in the West Coast, but I think that the potential there is fairly remote and doesn't justify the cost, um, in my opinion. And that's my opinion. I agree. I haven't seen any any significant changes. How many years have you gone back to that? that? I've only been ten or three. You've gone three. And I I say I don't see I've seen anything a changes. Change. change on that. So. I've seen I've seen votes change, and I've seen their legislative aides take different positions and say things we never considered that before. Because your voice has more than Greg Walton's because we're able to tell a different story than Greg tells. Greg can't tell Jackson County's story. Greg tells second congressional district story that represents all the counties in a general broad piece. But when we talk about our county specifically, it, it brings it home because we can relate it to their home county or their counties that are right there that they're representing. Uh, a powerful discussion piece has been recently of of being able to show the impacts that they're going to have on their trails and their maintenance of their roads. Because one of the representatives that I spoke to, you know, Senator Stephen, he had no idea that he, the comment was, well, right now, why should I care about what's happening on the West Coast with timber? I have my road maintenance funds being depleted right now. I've got to figure out how to keep my roads open. And I just was able to sit down and talk to him and say, this is just a... This is your pre-notice that you're going to shut it down, and this is what happened to us. And this is what we're dealing with on the West Coast. And it's this, this, and this. And went through a long, long conversation because I never even thought about it like that. Thank you for bringing this to my attention. Well, we just attended a meeting the other day with, with the Forest Service. We had, they, they're going to close roads anyway. I mean, we have very little voice there as well. You're locally. Well, I hate to diminish what voice we do have. That's just, I, I believe in doing it for a representative, for our people, we represent our people. That's the way I believe. Well, I, re I realize our interests are what happens locally in Jackson County, but this legislation is definitely not about Jackson County. It's about regions and areas and general overall overarching policies. So if there were the opportunity to, to um, influence votes, then it sounds like we should have a full-time lobbyist back there. But I don't know if that's... It's supposedly is what NACO is. We paid them to yeah, be our lobbyists. The lobbyists have come to us and has been this board's position in the past that we will not pay a lobbyist. We will do the job ourselves. And that means that we are going to go back and do that work. 
Okay, let me just correct that. The previous board's positions have been that we're not going to have a lobbyist on retainer. If we have the need for a lobbyist, we'll go out and seek one if the board wants <coughs> to do it. And I'm not saying we need a lobbyist either. I'm just saying if that, if those votes are that easily or that available to be swayed, then somebody should be back there working on it full time. But I don't know. You know, these are anecdotal things. I don't know. I haven't seen the results um, of these efforts bearing fruit. So again, for me, I'm, I'm going to have to make the cutoff for my own personal cost-benefit analysis and say that the legislative conference isn't one I see making that cut. No. So are you, though, okay. disagreeing that anyone will go, or do you want me to budget for one person? Well, that's a, that is a, I'll be attending. Well, if, if the board decides that it's not a, a cost-effective expenditure of resources, then that would be something you pay with your own funds. I'm not saying that's the determination that was made, but it, that is a discussion that needs to be had. It's significant. It's, you know, $3,300. That one, I think that one and the Pilgrim, I think, is, needs to be on hold. I would agree. So you see no impact on Pill whatsoever. We were we fully funded on Pill this year because of our efforts. Fully funded. And you're saying we have no we, we should be involved in that. Well, here's, here's the way I'm going to have to break it down. We, we got fully funded. Was that because Jackson County sent one commissioner to Washington, or was it the efforts of the people that we, again, all of our other lobbyists and advocates that we pay money towards our organization, and our representatives that, that are in Washington? Is it because of them, or is it because we sent one commissioner from Jackson County? And I'm going to say that, unfortunately, not to diminish what you try to do, wasn't the determining factor. I sit on the executive committee that makes the decisions to tell staff how to proceed forward with the with what organization? With WIR. See, and that you have WIR also. But that's a totally different thing. No, you said it was the same. Pilt is the work of WIR. Like I said, these all have some benefit. <coughs> the, the problem and is so to, to correct what you're. Yes, this some. commissioner has an impact at that level with PILT and WIR and how we direct staff. This, I do have that impact. And I sit on the board of trustees that directs the funds that says how we're going to work the WIR and keep that moving, or work the PILT issue moving forward that directs the funds on how that goes forward. And I'm so I do have a major opinion. impact there. I understand that's your opinion and that's the way you feel about it. I personally make a determination based on what I see. And I also make, when, when I'm sitting here looking at this, I'm also considering the overall travel budget um, that has come to light that I, that I mean, didn't know the total city, but, but it seems to be getting to a level that we need to make some tough choices on what we uh, attend and what we spend money on. Remember, my legislative conference is reimbursed Okay, so that makes a difference. That's not something that we pay for. That makes so to micromanagement and say I'm not going to attend on something you get reimbursed on. I'm going to tell We're you this. Managing our budget. The, yeah, yeah. The management of resources that are expended by the county and determining whether it's worth the, the benefit is mm -hmm. justifying the cost is not micromanaging. So, so legislative conference is reimbursed? It's reimbursed as long as there's not additional work that in the past there's been additional work above the Naval Legislative Conference that they haven't reimbursed us for. So they're a cost to us. If Commissioner Brian calls this chance, he's just doing the legis legislative conference, then the agreement is that we get reimbursed. Well, I think do what you get reimbursed sure, for. Sure, yeah, if it's reimbursed, that, that to me changes the entire equation. Is PILT reimbursed as well? Partially. Like what? How much is fifty? It depends. It depends on what the board of trustees we decide to do for the year, and how important the what piece of legislation we're moving forward. That's how much funds we're going to allocate allocate to bring people in. 
And when do they budget then? Uh, we went through that process. Uh, we have not paid this next fly-in, because that's in September, so we won't be discussing that piece until the future future meeting, probably the legislative conference when we meet, right? because that's when the WIR board meets. So if it's if it's 50%, then that does change the uh, calculus for me. That makes more sense. And I would say if at the end we know a figure or two. Well, here, here's an example. I know we need to budget for the entire amount. This is a legislative conference, an ACO legislative conference that Doug attended. The total cost was $4,812.77. ALC only reimbursed us for 3638 so we had a cost of roughly 1200 bucks or $1,173. This is, this is, you know, this is where I'm talking about if there's things that, it, that are being performed by Fisher Brighton Ball that are outside of the scope of the conference, which they reimburse us for the remainder of our cost. Correct, but also <coughs> those were expenses approved by the board because of meetings that were outside of the conference at the time. Well, I, I'm not saying they weren't approved or not. Right, but I want to make sure that's clear that they were board approved at the time. So here's an example of PILT, where there was a fly-in in Washington, D.C. We were reimbursed $400. If you look at the PILT fly-in, the total cost is $2,738. So but I wouldn't say that's 50%. Yeah, I can't tell you that that's, we changed that number this last year. So. Um, I, all I can do is go by what the experience is we it have. It changes from year to year based on the need. <coughs> well, I say if it's reimbursed and you have the time, you can do it. Okay. But the I'm reimbursed that, but at 400 of 2800 is really not being know. reimbursed. Um, the legislative conference looks to me like it's reimbursed nearly fully, especially for not doing a lot of extra meeting some uh, additional days, so I would be okay with the legislative conference to pill fly in. And what are we budgeting for, 700000 Is that, honestly, is that in jeopardy if we don't send a commissioner? Is that what our 15 or 16, 17 budgeted pill revenue we're expecting, 700000 I don't remember off the top of my head, I'd have to look. <coughs> it's gonna change this year from traditional because the fact that we're going back on receipts and we no longer have subsidies, that's going to change the whole process. The discussion now is what that formula looks like because a lot of the western states who have been on SRS over the past few years have had large subsidies. That being gone, if there's going to be a balancing. Those counties that receive less money because of the SRS subsidy will have an increase in PILT. Those counties that had a higher PILT will have a decrease because of the offset some of the SRS. So there will be a balancing across the nation when it comes to that. Now there's a lot of discussion right now on what that PILT formula looks like because of the western states have the SRS piece in there because there's a, a, there's a recognized need by Congress that there has to be something else done because they understand that they're the roadblock for getting back to work in the woods. So if we want to be part of that discussion on what that looks like is entirely up to you guys, but I can tell you that that built formula is going to be discussed. Did, did the 2700 include additional meetings and additional nights or lodging other than... Um, it's got six. six yeah, days. six is, that's, that's seems long. It typically well, is hold on. Um, so average five nights, six days is what it says actually on the, and I think five nights is what it's been. I mean, that's what it's been so far. And if I get pared down, like a tight in other. And it's 400 I say we pick at Walden's office every day instead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Already. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, and four hundred. That is the reimbursement again that is expected this year. No. Well, that's yeah. one that we already got for the last trip. That we were on. And I can't say that that's necessarily going to be the case moving forward because of the fact that we're sitting on that board of trustees that governs those funds. We're in the discussion right now on what we're going to do with the new board with the, with the change in the board and how we're going to allocate those funds. So that's what I'm saying.
saying you can't look at traditional means because we've changed everything this last cycle. We're in the process of changing everything and modifying it. So if I'm correct, but you can correct me if I'm wrong, but there was an omnibus bill that passed. What that does is lock in any current legislation until SRS are expired, which means right now, based on the budget that they just approved, there is no pill funding and there is no SRS funding. There's pill funding not fully funded. No, I'm talking about for the budget they just approved, not for the year that we just got pill for. Correct, they got fully approved in the omnibus. Fully funded. So if it's already time. fully funded, why would we need this to This is in September of next year, working on the next piece of legislation. The stuff that we did in the past got it into this omnibus. So that we're, we're talking, you're, you're working six to eight months ahead of time. This is Sometimes for September year, of next year, that is what I'm saying. This is for September of 16. That's what I'm saying. And that work done in September of 2016 will be looking at legislation that's coming forward in 17, 18. So you're, I don't, you're working forward on that. I agree. I agree. Well, for okay. the current year. Yeah. Current year, we've already done that work Correct. and we got it fully funded. And that's the return on investment that you, you're seeing right now. I'm going to say that what I intended, what I, from the day I stepped into office, wanted to do was get a handle on spending, travel spending especially, uh, not especially, but, but in addition to everything else. And I knew there was going to have to be some tough decisions on, on things we weren't able to do, and I'm, I'm going to stick with this is what I think um, we can miss. I don't see a huge absolute need, um, and that's kind of the, the line I'm going to have to hear also. Here's something else you need to know. I'll be the president of the Western Interstate Region starting in May. That is the work done by WIR. Then why aren't they paying for it? Well, that's the question. Even if they pay for it, we budget it, we pay for it, we get reimbursed. Yeah, that's why I asked what the reimbursement. If there was full reimbursement, there would be no question. A lot and of times, but I'll be the pres president of the organization, and that is the one thing that that organization does the most of is pills. And that's what I'm trying to say. I'll be in charge of the whole thing. When you say I don't have, we don't have a voice from Jackson County, we have the strongest voice from Jackson County nationally because I will be the president of the organization. Well, so one commissioner that does make a difference here. If that is that organization's sole mission and you're the president, I would think that they would have, and I know they have a budget, I would think that they would have in that budget to send their president to their most important engagement that they it's have not, on there. It's not just their only mission, but that is one of their main missions that they've done. In the WIR budget, budget for the conference call you had last week to approve the WIR budget, or to discuss the WIR budget, I saw that there's a new line item for president travel for $5,000 that hasn't existed before. You're two different things. There's a trust fund that covers all the built fly-in. The, the trust fund is specifically set up to cover costs. Now, they don't treat the president or the vice president or the executive any different than anybody else that attends. We specifically pick people outside in the country. Some of them are coming from the East Coast, some of them are the South because we need commissioners that have influence over specific legislators. Yeah, I'm not disagreeing with you I know, on that. That's what I'm trying what to I'm say. What I'm wondering about is the $5,000. It's not, that's what I'm trying to say. The trust fund covers the costs on the tilt fly-in. The budget for WIR has a whole different purpose. It doesn't cover that piece. It covers the, the tri president's travel that they want to put in place that they did for Gordon this year is because the, they want the WIR president to be able to attend state meetings with different states as they move forward because just like we have our state association meeting that you feel so important, just like you saw the past president for NACO sitting in the audience, oh, you guys weren't there. Um, the past president for NACO, Ricky, who's part of the executive committee, was there in the business meeting to be able to gather the information to take back to the national side. They want to do the same thing with the WIR, so that's the purpose. So not just the president's travel, but the, or the president who they deem is necessary. It might be if it's in Montana, the representative or the board member from Montana would be there. So it might cover the travel for the 
road travel, and then that person can report back to the executive committee. Yeah, I just saw the line on it, and all I was wondering is, is that funds totally, that can be available to reimburse the not account. for the pill. That, that's a totally different deal. That's what I'm trying to say. There's a trust fund that covers a portion, but we try to spread it out as much as possible because we need key people there. But there will be an expectation that the president of the WIR is there for the flying. So the county doesn't want to be part of that. I'll have to find some other way to attend it, but I'll have to attend it because I'll be in charge of the organization. Well, again, if they have a travel fund, but you said they don't treat the president or vice president any differently than any other member, then it appears to me they're not putting a priority on those people being there. Absolutely necessarily. The trust fund covers that piece, not the WIR budget. It's but but it doesn't it only cover four hundred. I mean, last time it covered four hundred dollars. That's right? because we brought in more people from key areas that we needed. It. In the past, it's covered more. I think it's, I mean, it's it, in the past it's covered all the hotel rooms plus another piece of the travel. And I think that four hundred dollars is just the airfare, fifty percent of the airfare. And I think they actually covered the hotel room while we were all there last time. And I asked for the documentation. I didn't get that. Just so you know. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But I think that's what it was. Is that they covered the hotel room and then the four hundred went towards airfare. So it varies from year to year in how we're going to do it based on the need and on the political climate at the time. Because you can't just treat every single time the same. Well, how about this? I I could. This is just a suggestion. I can budget for one person to attend, contingent on us getting a, a good level of reimbursement. So that way, when it gets near, we can determine with uh, WIR whether you know what the what the reimbursement would look like. I'm assuming they can before you go. We'll have to determine what it's going to be. We haven't had the discussion yet. Well, right, that's what I'm so saying. That's why I can't answer your question. Because it sounds like to me you're fine if it's reimbursed. Yes. Um, with even uh, even to a, a, a higher level. I mean, I'm trying to justify again. We we're going down the list, and we're not making a lot of cuts here. And there's going to have to be some tough decisions made. But if it's reimbursed, that changes the equation. Um, the other factor is to me is that this is if you're the president this year, you. <coughs> pushed off the stage in the next year. So that means the following year there will be no necessity. Actually, the immediate past president is it's still on, It's a four-year commitment. So when I, when I came into this, the board knew it was a four-year commitment for these expenditures. Well, I, don't so think, I don't think I, I wasn't on the board when uh, the decision to, to support that was made, but I don't think that uh, unlimited expenditures on, on trips like this were part of that uh, discussion or agreement. I think those things are always reserved for discussion. There was a commitment to no less than four pieces per year, four different trips per year. And that's part of when you run for that office and the board says you're good to go for that office, it's a commitment. And if you read through all the bylaws and all this the stuff, and you go online and read about it, you're committed to a four-year process. I, I don't intend to pull the rug out from anybody, but um, obviously this board's not bound by previous boards either. I want to I want to support it, but I also want to make sure that we're making good, financially responsible decisions here. For Jackson County, and I, I sometimes even think about the payment move taxes as a school asking for a welfare check as well. I mean, as far as being behind that, so, um, and with Doug stepping up as their president, I think it's, you know, he obviously needs to be there if it's reimbursed, and I think they need to go on their budget as well as, as we are, that we should consider that reimbursement. Yeah, I think we should see that. I'll, I'll, I'll budget a person prior to the September meeting, it's September of 2016, we'll have dates yet, we'll come back to the board okay. with an estimate on what WIR is telling us they can reimburse if they can tell us. Um, if they can't tell us, you can make whatever decision you want. Right. Okay, so then the uh, WIR conference in Sun River. Of course, that's not one that I'll be attending. No, me. Is this one does it have some reimbursement attached to it? It's a WIR conference. Yes. We know to what amount, to what extent, and 
Mm-hmm. That should be fully reimbursed except for my time. Okay. As long as there's not additional stuff that gets added to it. I don't see any legislative work to be done there. Okay, so, so this I, under others in the email that I sent you, I had OLCC listed because that was one that Commissioner Brian Paul participated in this year. We don't know. I, I, I need to know if you want us to budget something for that for next year. And also, I had an AFRC in the email that I sent you. So those were two others that I just didn't know. Um, and that rulemaking process has been completed. They're keeping the OLCC rack in place. They'll be convening it here again. The rulemaking process is not complete because the legislature is going to change some of the, the laws. So they are going to be reconvening here shortly, and there's some corrections that have to be made as we go forward also. Some of those corrections have already been made. Do you have an estimate how many meetings you're talking about? I couldn't estimate that right now. All I've been told is they're going to reconvene it sometime around February. And these are all other have a better idea state. then. Well, if they're going to do it in, in this fiscal year, it doesn't matter. Right. February is the current fiscal year. You all have already agreed in the current fiscal year to pay for it, even though we didn't budget for it. Because um, this came up after our budget. The LLCC thing came up after the budget. So, but I'm talking about for 16 17. And then after the short session, there'll be some more rulemaking meetings that probably I would hope would go beyond June, but who knows? I couldn't answer that. It was surprising me that they, when I was told that it's their intent to maintain this committee. It really surprised me. I thought we'd be over for the dates that we're going to keep. No, well, I think it's important to continue with what we've done there. So I. So do I'll you think I should budget two or three meetings? Yeah, just in case. <coughs> I think that's probably <coughs> three cool. on the outside. Just right, it's, that's hard to say. I, I won't have more information until February. And do then, you ever see them disbanding? I, mean, I don't at this point. I think that they're going to maintain the standard piece for a while because it's so. It's moving in all of because I looked at what's happened in Colorado and in Washington. It's it's, it's morphed, and, they, and I think OLCC has noticed that also that they've talked about that. It's taken years to really dial it in, so it's hard to say what their intent is. I've talked to the chairman a little bit, and for the OLCC, and well, nothing else. It shouldn't be very frequent. And I wouldn't think it would be. No. That was the pretty heavy lift right there. Okay, so we budget for three in uh, 16, 17? Three for one person is what I'm going to put. Okay. And then AFRC? I don't know. I went last year, but I wasn't as fully involved, and I'm not sure that it was. I mean, it was interesting, but I don't know. What, what is the cost of that one? Well, I don't have a cost because we didn't budget one previously. Was, was it, is it in the same place? It was yeah. like $600 or eight or something. I would say it's not unlike a trip to Salem, probably, you know, one night in two days. Yeah, I, I find the FRC is, is relevant. To the ONC? It's, it's very relevant to land management and timber management. I, I find it can. Oh, you're going to go? Uh, yeah. Oh, so I think once plenty. Last year, I couldn't make it, so they right. actually go in my place. So is it one meeting? Yeah, it's one meeting. In, is it in Salem? Last year it was in Washington. Yeah, right? yeah it's I think it's the same place as Stevenson. But it's just like driving to Portland, it's just right there across the bridge. Okay, so under miscellaneous, but well, unless there's other things that you all can think of, I, mean, I think we do a pretty good job hopefully capturing everything. Um, and as I said, so we do have miscellaneous, which is essentially a contingency. Um, and then we budgeted for a uh, retreat. Um, and typically that gets split two thirds between your budget and one third between CAO. And so the total cost is 37 cents. If you don't anticipate on having a retreat, then we don't need to budget for it. Yeah, that generally is more necessary if there's a different board, a new member. I mean, isn't that? Kind of the way you approach that? It's been sporadic. When I first started 10 years ago, there was one every year for three or four years. And then it went to every other year, every three years, when new, you know, when there would be a new board. Um, and I think, well, Commissioner Breitenthal has been here three years now, and he's had two, I think, 
treats. So well, I thought it was good. <coughs> I thought it was a good uh, discussion that needed to be had at that point. Um, I don't feel we're at a point myself where, where we need that, but if there is a new commissioner, which, you know, again, uh, there is a contingency there, then I think those are valuable. Thirty-seven. That, that, that seems to me, unless there is a new commissioner, I would say I would, I would uh, consider budgeting for that. I'd budget accordingly, and then nothing says you have to execute it. The decision can be made not to spend the funds, or just the same with all of it. Well, dollars for refreshments, are we? Well, we have meals for four people and breakfast and lunch and yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Um, yeah, see, it says mill slash refreshment, so I guess you're oh, kind okay. of going to change. change. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, just to comment on what Commissioner Brian Paul just said, when you budget something, I, I wouldn't say just budget it and then if you decide not to spend it, it's okay, because when you budget something, we allocate those costs to all the departments and it affects their budgets. So if you're not if you're not going to spend it, we don't have to allocate a cost to them. That gives them more funding to be able to deliver services. If you know we're just budgeting everything you may do, they're going to end up paying indirect costs. Now we do go back and make the adjustment at the next fiscal year in that indirect cost allocation, but it makes the funds unavailable to them for that time. Mm -hmm. I, I personally, I would say this not I don't see I don't see it being necessary. I don't either, actually. Okay, I had a couple more questions if there's nothing else on those. Um, so this year we had... I have one question. Okay. On uh, subscriptions, and I don't know if it's cash or press, because it's not worth like $50. I can't give it up. I don't care. I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute. I want that. <laughs> so you want <laughs> the you guys want to press. go through the front front of these? That's all that I thought. I don't know if we ever get the upper row intended. I see how. Yeah, we do. Oh, we do. Okay. That's all that I thought. Because Linnell mentioned something, that I was a little bit excited. I am, and I mean, I look at it, but not. And, and we'll it. check with Rocky on the uh, association accounts number. Okay. Um, a couple more things. Uh, this year, we had two commissioners that had iPads, so we have a monthly service fee, ninety dollars for those two. And I wanted to know if the if third commissioner wants one or not, because we it would add forty-five dollars to the monthly service fee, and then also a six hundred time dollar one time setup fee. No, thank you. Okay, and then just to verify the two of you still. I use mine a lot. I use mine for all my notes during meetings. And yes. Those, that was it for your budget. Other than that, it's pretty much personnel. Okay. And you're going to get the information back when you're on the stuff? Yeah, we'll yes. ask Rocky. Yeah, I mean, not just the meetings, but not the, uh, the cost, the dues. The dues. And the number of meetings. I do want to say to the Commissioner Bright told us so you know we wouldn't budget for litigation as part of the dues. You, you said I, I understand that we do a special assessment on that, but I'm just saying I don't see anything for OMC budgeted in this current year. But I know that um, we talked about it and with Commissioner Rasher um, being able to pay that. And I thought we would pay two years at one time, this year and next year. Well, we may have made that up last time, last year's budget. I don't know. I was yeah. telling you that that's the number Rocky gave us was zero in the current year's budget. I just want to make sure that's because we're paid ahead or you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, okay, anything else? Um, no, I think that's it. Okay.